Welcome everyone. Um, we just uh, had uh, an interesting uh, IPC colloquium by Vasily um, Beroporo, who is sitting over there. Um, and he's visiting us from the other Cambridge. Uh, when when uh, George Stati was here, I said the real Cambridge, but for you, because you are not sort of British, uh, I said the other Cambridge. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Sayan Chakraborty, our own, um, and, and he will tell us about the missing link uh, in the supernova GRD connection. And then we'll hear more from Vasily, that will tell us about the Milky Way mass from the Sagittarius stream procession. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, uh, the C CFA colloquium speaker today, uh, the Clay um, uh, Colloquium, uh, Kate uh, Rubin, who is sitting over there, uh, and she will tell us about um, spatially resolving galactic gas flows with uh, SDSS IV slash MA NGA. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, we'll hear from Vincente Rodriguez Gomez, um, who will tell us from the IPC, um, will tell us about the merger rate of galaxies in the illustrious simulation. I should also mention that next to me sits uh, Xing Gang uh, Chen, who is visiting us from the uh, uh, University of Texas in Dallas, and he works primarily in the first, on the first uh, 10 to the minus 35 seconds of the universe. That's his main focus. Thank you. 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 So, hello everyone. Uh, today I'll tell you about an object which we feel is a long sought after missing link in the supernova GRB connection. But before we tell you about that, uh, we have to recap about what the supernova GRB connection is. So, we will start with a trilogy. Uh, and to understand something, we need a map of it. We need to know what happens inside it. And so, let's try and figure that out if we can do it for supernovae and GRB. So, supernovae, part one. Uh, supernovae to first order, we think of spherical cows in the sky. And for example, uh, Kepler saw a supernova. Uh, he thought it's a new star near the foot of serpents. And if we look there now, there's a spherical cow in the sky. Uh, not all supernovae are like this, but we'll have this image in mind. Uh, some supernovae are core collapse. In that, uh, they're massive stars, their cores collapse, uh, emit a lot of neutrinos and the outer layers go out into a supernova. And this is the LMC before 1987A, and this is 1987A. Uh, in 1980, by 1987, we were already expecting to that supernovae produce neutrinos, and this one did produce neutrinos, and human beings did catch them, at least at two different detectors. Um, once these neutrinos were seen, the gross properties of supernovae as we understood them were more or less clear. Uh, we still don't know how exactly they explode, but we know that their cores collapse into neutron star, they emit neutrinos, the outer layers produce the visible light. So that's supernovae. This brings us to the second part of our story, which is GRBs. Uh, this is uh, a lot of politicians in 1963 signing the partial test ban treaty, agreeing not to test nuclear weapons above ground. But of course, politicians don't trust each other. So they want to keep an eye on each other. So this was the start of Project Vela, which put up uh, these detectors in the sky, hoping to detect uh, Russian uh, atomic tests, which were carried on surreptitiously in space. And they did not detect any Russian tests, but they were a very uh, successful failure. They did detect GRBs and they wrote about GRBs in 1973. Uh, what do we think makes GRBs? We think GRBs, many of them, come from collapsars, uh, at least the long GRBs, uh, in which the core of a star collapses into a compact object, uh, which accretes from the material falling back from the outer layers of the star and produces jets. These jets have to be very powerful. One, they must be very fast. Uh, when they're fast, uh, the gamma rays that we see in the rest frame, they're not really gamma rays. Therefore, they don't destroy each other by pair production. Also, they must be very light. 
if they are not very light, uh, the baryons in the jets uh, soak up all the energy in the jet and leaving very little behind for the gamma rays. So, fast and light jets produce GRBs, that is what we think, at least the long GRBs. Um, now for the connection. So, in 1998, there was a GRB and people looking fast and accurately at that location found a supernova in the error box of the GRB. That supernova also had very bright radio emission. This radio emission tells us that there was relativistic motion in this GRB. So, which completes our story of the supernova GRB connection in the sense that some GRBs are produced essentially in a small fraction of supernovae. These apart from producing the supernova also produce jets. These jets are light and fast and very fast and very light and these produce the GRBs. Now the question is for, for every major league player that we see on TV, there are many many minor league players which never make it to television or never make it to the big leagues. So, for every jet which makes a GRB, which uh, is very fast, very light and pointed towards us, uh, there must be many others which do not fulfill these criteria. They could be pointed elsewhere, they could be poisoned by baryons, they could be a little slower and not make GRBs. Where are those? There must be many relativistic supernovae. And so, one possible way of doing that is a jet which is either not very focused like the last one and barely makes out of the star's envelope and it is poisoned by baryons, it is not tightly focused and it does not go very far outside the star. It just, it is a puny jet which just barely makes out of the star. So, there should be many of these, where are they? So, we were looking for them in type 1 BC supernovae, type 1 C mostly and uh, this is one of them. This is 2012 AP, this is the radio afterglow of that supernova. What you see here is frequency on the x axis and flux density on the y axis and different lines are different epochs. As time goes on, uh, this spectrum moves to lower energies and actually becomes uh, milder with time. Uh, at every epoch if we know, uh, so this is a textbook case of synchrotron self absorption. Uh, the same electrons which produce the power law on the right uh, eat up all the emission on the lower frequencies and produce the absorption. Uh, by measuring both the optically thin and optically thick parts of the spectrum for every epoch you can measure out the sizes uh, very robustly and once you measure out the sizes uh, you can plot them. Uh, once you plot them and compare it with what you know about the explosion date of that object you can figure out whether or not this explosion is relativistic. And this one e is relativistic as you can see it expands at around half the speed of light. Uh, the other thing that you can figure out is whether or not this explosion is slowing down because your initial date is anchored somewhere uh, having these data points uh, tells you whether it slows down or not. And this one slows down and slows down precisely in a manner which we would expect out of a light light and relativistic ejecta interacting with the wind of the pre-explosion progenitor and therefore, we thought it looks like a GRB, it behaves like a GRB in time, maybe it is a GRB. So, we decided to look for gamma ray emission from this object at that portion of the sky at that time and we thought let us look at all the satellites which look for GRBs. There is and these are satellites in space of course, uh, we looked at Agile, Hete 2 and these all together form the interplanetary network of satellites looking for GRBs and we looked at all of them and did not find anything. So, this guy did not produce uh, gamma rays. Uh, the upper limit on this object is a tighter by a factor of 6 compared to 98 BW which is one of the puny GRBs anyway. So, what does it tell us about this object? Uh, this is a summary slide. Uh, this object is pretty light, the relativistic ejecta that this object threw out is much lighter than that of a supernova. Why? Because we saw it slow down. Uh, this object is very fast, uh, we saw its radio evolution, so we know that it is fast, which places it in a place in between supernovae and GRBs. Supernovae we know uh, go out at around 10,000 kilometers per second throughout a solar mass of stuff, uh, 
and GRBs on the other hand are uh, plugged here in the little corner here because they have to be very fast to solve the pair production problem. Uh, they also cannot be poisoned by baryons as I told you earlier. So GRBs are here, supernovae are here. This object is somewhere in between. So we think we have found an object which is intermediate in properties between supernovae and GRBs in that it is relativistic. Uh, so it's similar to GRBs in that it is relativistic and that it slows down rapidly because it has a low mass ejector. Uh, but it is similar to supernovae in the sense that it doesn't produce gamma rays. So with that, I'll take questions from you. It, it could be. Uh, so, so the problem with so G, uh, orphan GRB, if it was looked at from a large angle, should rise much later. This one rose rose early enough. Uh, that's one. So it's not a very off-axis GRB. Uh, it could be a just off-axis GRB. Uh, that would be hard to rule out. It could be a orphan afterglow. So that's one plausible explanation for it. The other is that it's a jet which is pointed towards us, but not fast or light enough. Questions for Sam? Josh? What, what's the host galaxy? What's the uh, it's around 40 megaparsecs away. So it's a similar distance to 98 BW. Yes, so the rates of these objects are very large. Um, uh, two relativistic supernovae have been found in around 200 uh, 1C supernovae, which have been observed, so 09BB, and then this one. And this one was uh, rapidly slowing down, so it's similar to GRBs in that aspect. But the fact that we see it at this distance implies a very large rate, a rate which is much larger than the rate of cosmological GRBs, but a rate which is nonetheless similar to that of the low redshift GRBs like 98BW. And the amount of energy released in these explosions, is it similar to or So there's the optical display, which looks like a bright 1C supernova. Then there's a radio display, which is possibly detached from the main optical display. And the radio light curves look very similar to 98BW. Uh, so, so synchrotron self-absorption or equipartition arguments would place the energy in the relativistic ejector as similar to that of 19. <laughs> Is it yours? Yeah. I'll be Please fine. I'll can just... Yeah? Does it need any configuring? So if I just try, yeah. yeah, it works. Left and right, and this is the... Thanks, Sayan. Thanks very much, Sayan, for the clicker. Hi, bon appetit. <coughs> I would like to tell you about... Can you hear me, actually? Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, I would like to tell you about the measurement of the Milky Way mass profile <coughs> with a completely new method. And this new method invokes stellar streams, and we think it gives the best mass measurements compared to all previous methods. So you should all use our measurement of the Milky Way mass. Why do we care about Milky Way's mass? So a year ago, uh, 
we launched a Gaia mission into space. And after five years of collecting data, we will be able, using Gaia's uh, catalogs of distances, proper motions, brightnesses, stellar atmosphere parameters of stars, of billion stars in the galaxy, reconstruct Milky Way in exquisite detail. We will assemble this puzzle of the Milky Way in detail previously unknown. However, to take this puzzle and put, and put it into the cosmological framework within which we form structures like Milky Way, we need to know in which mass dark matter halo Milky Way resides. And this mass appears to be extremely uncertain. So here is the review of the mass measurements at different... <gasps> Whoa. <laughs> where is the... Um, science, sorry, where is the laser? Uh, the middle one. Is the, laser. the middle one, okay. <laughs> okay, here is the review of mass measurements of the Milky Way with the distance from the galactic center in kiloparsecs and the circular velocity that tells you how much mass there is at every radius. And you can see there are huge error bars. And of course, the error bars grow quite quickly with distance, because here you can measure um, stars and gas on circular orbits. And it's kind of easy to extract the mass measurement at the small radii where you have things rotating on circular orbits. Nothing is rotating beyond 20 kiloparsecs on circular orbits or otherwise. So we have to use genes modeling to extract mass from motions of tracers at large distances. And of course, we only get line of sight uh, measurement of the 3D velocity. So we have to assume something about the anisotropy of, those, of orbits of those tracers. That's why the error bars are probably underestimated here. They're huge. So you get a range of Milky Way masses in which Milky Ways, very light Milky Ways, are allowed to exist with very heavy Milky Ways. How to break this degeneracy, to get rid of this degeneracy, how to measure Milky Way mass accurately. So the most precise measurement of the mass profile in the Milky Way is within this distance from the galactic center. And it's a 10% measurement of the mass. And it's extremely precise because we have a complete orbit of a star around the thing that dominates the mass budget, around the supermassive black hole. And if uh, Newton Newtonian gravity is true, having obtained an orbit, it's extremely easy to infer the mass distribution. And in Keplerian case, when you have a point mass, the orbits are ellipses, they close. And if the mass distribution is extended, orbits won't close, this ellipse will start to precess. And it's clear why it does it, because at the upper center of the orbit, the star sees all the mass within the orbit, but when it reaches small distances close to Perry, a lot less mass is there, because the mass is di distributed along the radius, so star's velocity is too high around per center, so it misses, it overshoots, and the ellipse starts to rotate. But the orbital precession, the angle between successive uh, loops, the petals of this pattern, actually encodes something important about the potential. So the eccentricity and the size of the orbit are constrained by the energy and angular momentum of the thing that is orbiting. But the potential, or how quickly mass density drops with radius, tells us what the orbital precession would be. So if we can measure orbital precession, we can measure mass, or even the density along the radius. Orbital period of the star is a order of 10 years, so it's uh, a good PhD project. Orbital periods, <coughs> orbital periods at distances of 100 kiloparsecs are of order of giga year. So it's not good for a PhD. Yet, 
Of course, we can't wait for a giga year for things to complete their orbits, but we can do something cleverer. We can use tidal streams. So tidal streams actually reveal orbits. And I'll remind you how this happens. If you imagine a satellite of our galaxy, a ball of stars, maybe a star cluster or a dwarf galaxy, and the center of Milky Way is somewhere under this floor, around the satellite you will have Lagrange 1 and Lagrange 2 points, and the stars that belong to the satellite, if they reach Lagrange 2 or Lagrange 1, around there they will be free to choose whether to stay in the satellite or to leave the satellite and start orbiting around the Milky Way. And some stars will choose to leave. And those that leave through Lagrange 1, they'll have lower energy and lower angular momentum compared to the progenitor. Their orbital periods will be faster, will be shorter, so they will move faster in angular, um, in the angle, in orbital phase, and they will lead the satellite. And the stars that leave through Lagrange 2, will, they'll have high energy and high angular momentum. Their orbital periods will be longer, and they will start to trail. And because these regions around Lagrange points are quite small, the initial conditions for stars that leave through here and through here will be quite similar. So they will arrange themselves on tidal tails that will be whoa, streaming along the orbit of the progenitor. If only I knew how to get rid of this thing. I'll just switch off. Right, so if we can find tidal streams that are long enough, we can perhaps hope to reconstruct the orbit, and with the orbit we can hope to reconstruct the potential. I'll show you a movie of how a tidal stream forms. All I'm doing, I'm releasing Gaussian swarms of particles every time the progenitor reaches pericenter. So the pericenter crossing are shown here as white circles. And every time I'm just releasing Gaussian blobs, and they redistribute themselves along the orbit of the progenitor, forming these tidal tails. And you can see that the orbital precession is readily visible if we knew the orbit. But if we have the stream, we can also measure the angle between two petals, between the petal of the leading and the petal of the trailing stream. So are there streams like these in the Milky Way? Well, in fact, there are. There is a huge stream covering the entire sky, and it's a stream from the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which itself is here, just under the bulge. This is alpha and delta, so coordinates on the sky. And the disk plane is avoided by Sloan. This is data from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And the regions of the stellar halo are surveyed. And so here I'm plotting the stellar density in the halo, and the color tells you how far away the stars are. So if the stars are red, these are 50 or 60 kiloparsecs away from us. If the stars are blue, they are as close as 10 kiloparsecs. So you can see this stream, the leading tail of the Sagittarius. And you can see there is a gradient of color that tells you that there's a gradient of distance. There's also a bit of trailing. In fact, we've surveyed, we've used the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we mined it to recover as much as possible information about the Sagittarius stream. What we get is summarized here. This is angular distance along the stream with progenitor here, and this is galactocentric <coughs> distance to the stream. And you can see we have a leading tail with its upper center and the trailing tail with its upper center. And these are corresponding velocities. And you can see that every time the stream reaches upper center, its radial velocity goes through zero. So from this plot, you can already measure the orbital precession angle between leading and trailing debris. I just need another 20 minutes. <laughs> Do I have another minute? <coughs> Look, that's what we thought the disruption looks like, and that's what we've measured. There is a clear mismatch, and that's because we assumed something wrong about the dark matter distribution in, in, in the halo of the galaxy. We've used the logarithmic halo before, and what we've measured now clearly drops faster. And these 
measurement, the idea behind this measurement is summarized here. Here is how fast the density changes. So this is the power of the power law, if you assume the potential is power law. And here is the precession angle. And this is Keplerian case, and this is logarithmic. And so if you measure the precession angle, you can almost read off this plot what the power law is for the potential. But it's much more complicated than this, <coughs> because you actually need to remember that streams are not orbits. I said streams reveal orbits, but they're not orbits themselves, because there is an offset between the stream debris and the progenitor in angle, in, in angle of momentum and energy space. And to do the inference, you need to be able to produce realistic streams quickly, which we do. I'm showing here end body took six hours. Our model took, ten, took two seconds. They look indistinguishable. With this in hand, we can actually measure the mass. This is mock data. <coughs> this is real data. That's the, the end, the result, the final slide. <coughs> Here are the measurements that I showed you before. This is now a cumulative mass profile from 0 to 120 kiloparsecs. We go through lower uh, ranges of those error bars, and our error bar, this is one sigma, is much smaller than any of these. And we don't have any degeneracy between anisotropy, density, and mass that genes analysis always has. So that's the end. Thank you. <coughs> Well, I, I think I agree. I, I would have agreed with everything you said, but I disagree with the first statement you made. I don't think Sagittarius can have as much as 10% of the Milky Way's mass because all the, um, all the constraints we have tell us that Sagittarius probably is only 10 to the 9 solar masses. In stars. No, no, no. 10 to the 8 at most in stars and perhaps as much as 10 to the 9 now or less in dark matter. Yeah, but the streams are produced when most of the dark matter has, has already been stripped. So we don't care what happens before. When the streams are starting to be produced, most of the dark matter is gone. So our analysis is still valid. It could have been, if you want to make it extremely dark matter dominated and put a lot more dark matter into it than we think is reasonable, you could do this, but it won't affect the, the results of this analysis. Yes. Yeah. Because I ran out of time. It's really bad. Um, <laughs> so what would be interesting for you to know is that all we modeled were three numbers. We didn't model the entirety of the stream measurements. All we modeled were the three properties, the distance to one upper center, the distance to the other upper center, and the angle between them. And we claim that that's enough to recover the mass profile. And all, we, all the tests we've done with Mock data, mock simulations, in a variety of potentials, tell us that we don't have any biases. If nothing crazy, if nothing crazy happens, we recover the mass profiles by just matching those three numbers perfectly. And that's only data we, we've actually modeled. We haven't modeled all the, you know, the whole bulk of the data that's available. So that's why I couldn't show you a stream, because all we matched were the, uh, the precession measurements. Yes. And are in the stream, they experience very little acceleration, right? Acceleration by what? By acceleration by anything at all. Like the total acceleration that they experience is very low, right? Because they're only now streaming through the Milky Way's potential. And they're very far from the Milky Way. They, 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 experience, they experience the acceleration that is appropriate for stars at that radius in the Milky Way potential. I'm so not sure why it is very little, but. So it would be an interesting proof for all these alternative models of gravity. Mm -hmm. Modify gravity. Yes. So you could 
Probably, yeah. I think I think it is a good test, and uh, I don't have a which uh, modified uh, something like mod. Like mod. Okay, so I guess I guess it is true, and if I had a um, yeah, I just need uh, an orbit integrator in mod in mod and gravity, and that I, that could be tested because our stream production is actually very simple. All we're doing is solving constraint free body problem here, and that's why it's so fast. So yes, I agree with you. It's a good point. You see it's flattening out the the cumulative mass profile. It's actually not growing at any significant rate. So when we extrapolate to virial radius, we get probably 80, so 0.8 times 10 to the 12. So the flattening is considered W? Well, so what we measure, what we model in the, this data with is a... Uh, um, a combined model, a parameterized combined model that basically has a rotation curve that is flat until some radius and that is allowed to drop with some rate beyond that radius. So we measure a combined contribution of the disk and the halo. So with, da with this data alone, we can't actually measure properties of an NFW. There will be a huge degeneracy between concentration and mass. But if we add more data or model more of the stream, I'm sure we can measure properties of the NFW. Uh huh. That's a that's a good question, and I guess I could could spend another hour talking about this. Uh, I think I think the way to distinguish between them is by looking at the chemistry of stars in the streams. If you believe that there is a, a abundance gradient in the progenitor, which we believe there is in Sagittarius, you can map these in the streams, and that will tell you information about the dynamical age of the stars in the streams. But what else is interesting about this particular stream is that, is that it appears bifurcated. There's a bright component and a faint component that are offset from each other on the sky. And we think that one way of explaining them is by producing one earlier, so at earlier peri-galactic crossing, and the other at later time. So there is some information which you could use to infer the dynamical age of the debris. But at the moment, it's still a bit, um, still a bit flaky. Yeah. Hey. So yeah, the pr correct pronunciation of uh, this mess of letters here uh, is Sloan for manga, just so everyone knows. Um, never take an acronym for granted, kids. Uh, okay, so I wanted to take this chance to show you all something quite preliminary, but I think potentially very exciting. So I'm just going to go for it. Um, so we all know that without gas accretion onto dark matter halos, galaxy formation is pretty much a non-starter. This is a process that is captured in every cosmological simulation of galaxy formation, of course. And here I'm showing you some lovely images from Dylan of this process occurring at redshift 2, uh, gas accretion onto a 10 to the 11.5 solar mass dark matter halo. And so on the left, he's showing us uh, gas density. On the right, he's showing us gas radial velocity. Um, and so you can see the overdense filaments here in this image um, have a radial velocity, a negative radial velocity over here, indicating that these dense filaments are flowing into the galaxy and are going to end up as future fuel for star formation. 
So we know this process has to be happening, but empirical evidence that it's actually happening is pretty hard to come by. Now we have some pretty strong evidence that our own galaxy is accreting gas, at least. Um, and that comes from studies of neutral hydrogen gas clouds um, around the galaxy in the halo. So we're especially uh, sensitive to high-velocity neutral hydrogen clouds, which can be observed in 21 centimeter emission. This is a map of those HVCs, as they're called. Um, and the color here uh, corresponds to the velocity of those clouds with respect to the galactic standard of rest. And you can see some of them have quite large negative velocities indicating they're flowing into the galaxy. And they could potentially, we don't often have uh, great constraints on the distances to these clouds, but in principle, since they're flowing in, they might end up for, as future fuel for star formation for us. And I think the single most convincing piece of evidence that gas is actually being accreted onto the disk of our galaxy comes from observations of the Smith cloud. This is, again, a 21 centimeter image of H1. Um, the Smith cloud has a mass of about 10 to the 6 solar masses. Um, it's about three kiloparsecs from the galactic plane, and it has its cometary appearance is very suggestive that it is, in fact, flowing toward the plane, and it also interacting with the uh, ISM associated with the galactic disk. And so I think this is a very strong case that, um, at least in this particular instance, gas is actually going to end up in the disk of our galaxy. Um, but of course, we can't image the halos of more distant galaxies in 21 centimeter emission. The gas around them is just way too faint. And so to study gas kinematics for more distant galaxies, we need to take a different approach. And that approach is normally to just take a spectrum of the galaxy and then any gas along the line of sight, um, which say is traveling into the galaxy, is going to give rise to redshifted absorption. And so this is just one example of a transition that traces cool photoionized gas, iron 2 at 2600 angstroms. Here the systemic velocity of this transition is shown in yellow. And you can see here the absorption is redshifted, indicating the gas is flowing into the galaxy. So we've done a survey of gas kinematics using these transitions um, for galaxies, star-forming galaxies at redshift 0.5. And it turns out that most galaxies are actually, actually exhibit blue-shifted absorption in these transitions, as shown here. Out of 100 galaxies, about two-thirds of them exhibit blue-shifted absorption like this, which is, we think is due to large-scale galactic winds. Um, but in six cases, we actually observe significantly redshifted absorption. And so the uh, transition looked a little bit more like this. Um, and just to reinforce the point, um, the reason why we detect uh, inflow onto these galaxies is because the equivalent width of this absorption line here um, red word of systemic velocity is larger than the equivalent with uh, blue word of systemic velocity in this transition. So the question is, we've detected inflow in six galaxies. Wow. Um, how can we further build samples of galaxies with robustly detected gas inflow in order to understand um, the demographics of galaxies with inflows, inflow, gas inflow morphology, etc.? Um, and so that's where the Sloan 4 Manga survey comes in. It will be the deepest, largest survey of galaxies ever performed. So it's ideal for searching for very uh, uh, rare signatures like this. So it is a spatially resolved spectroscopic survey done with the BOSS spectrograph, which has been modified um, so that one can observe each galaxy with an, a, a bundle of fibers represented here. 
Um, and so the spatial resolution of the survey is one to two kiloparsecs um, at the redshift of most of these galaxies. It's the size of each of the fibers within these bundles. The spectral resolution um, is about 60 kilometers per second. Um, and Kevin Bundy is the PI of this survey, and there have been many others who have played a very important role in making this happen, uh, some of whom are listed here. Um, and so the survey has started. It started in March 2014, and they've now observed about 1,000 galaxies. And it will be continuing over the next six years. And the CFA is a partner institution in Sloan 4. So this just shows you some of the galaxies that they've targeted so far um, with the footprint of each IFU bundle overlaid <coughs> on those galaxies. So let's just check out uh, what we can say. And of course, this survey um, enables a whole lot, a whole lot of uh, very interesting science, um, but I, since I'm interested in flows, we're, we're going to talk about that. So um, this is one of their galaxies that they've observed so far. It has a stellar mass of about 10 to the 9.7 solar masses, and it has very weak emission lines, so it has a low star formation rate. And so the first step uh, in this analysis is to bin up the data traditional to use a Voronoi, Voronoi binning scheme um, to uh, collect uh, spatial bins which have a requisite signal to noise for the analysis that we're going to do. So this just shows you where those spatial bins are with respect to the galaxy. Each color is a different bin, of course. And so then the next step is to model the stellar continuum of in each of these bins, and so that can be done to very high accuracy with the data analysis pipeline that's being developed by the Manga team. So this just shows you how uh, tightly we can fit the stellar continuum from this particular bin, bin zero. And all of the bumps and wiggles in this spectrum are very closely reproduced by the stellar population model. And then finally, so now we know what the stellar population looks like. We know exactly the velocity of the stars in this bin. And we can turn to what the sodium 1D doublet looks like in the spectrum. So we do not have access to the magnesium-2 or iron-2 absorption lines that I talked about before. Uh, since these galaxies, we can't access those uh, near-UV lines um, in the local universe from the ground. But these spectra do cover the sodium-1 D doublet at 5890 angstroms, which also absorbed in interstellar material. Um, one catch about sodium D is that it has an ionization potential of only 5 eV, so it's easily destroyed and can only exist in very cool, dusty gas. So we're looking at the kinematics of very cool, dusty gas here. So here is the sodium 1D uh, absorption transition in this particular uh, spatial bin. The systemic velocity of the two lines in the doublet are shown here. And now I'm going to uh, measure the equivalent width redward of this doublet line and blueward of this doublet line and compare them. We see that the absorption redward of the line is significantly stronger. I haven't included error bars here, uh, but it is significantly stronger than the absorption blueward of this line, which can only happen if the gas is flowing in. And we can uh, com uh, continue that experiment for uh, many of the rest of the spatial bins that you see here. Um, here, I've just developed a color bar for the equivalent width that I measure on each side of these lines. Um, and so you can see anywhere where the color here is redder than the color here, we see this signature for gas inflow onto this object. 
And so this is only seven of the bins that we're looking at here. In almost all of these particular bins, we do see the absorption redward of systemic is larger than the absorption blueward of systemic. Um, and this is just showing you those equivalent widths redward versus blueward. Um, all of the cyan points have equivalent widths significantly higher redward of that systemic. So in those spaxels, we are detecting evidence for redshifted absorption. So I think we found inflow onto this galaxy. Um, perhaps the first evidence for gas inflow on in seen in this sodium transition. And so I've explored this um, in a few of the other galaxies. I think I've looked at about 70 of the other galaxies so far and see evidence for this redshifted absorption in about 15 of the galaxies. Uh, they tend to be quite red. Here are some of the examples. They tend to be quite red, which I don't quite understand, but it may be related to the fact that sodium can only survive in very dusty environments. So I'm pretty excited about this. Um, it is preliminary work, but this is such a rare phenomenon that um, I think it will be very promising to follow it up. Um, and of course, the next steps are to measure uh, inflow velocities, column densities, morphologies, um, et cetera. So that's all. Thank you. Well, we don't know, you know, we don't know the distance between the absorbing gas and the galaxy. So this really could be quite close to the disk already. Um, and it could even be, you know, gas that has been driven out in an outflow that's being uh, falling back in now. And we know that outflows are really dusty. So they could have, that gas that's uh, been, been driven out of the disk could easily contain a lot of dust to protect the sodium. illustrious snapshot to some of the inflows that are quite narrow, uh, but it seems like you're getting uh, red, sh red shift equivalent widths that are comparable to the blue shift, which suggests that the covering fraction might be closer to unity for inflowing gas relative to outflowing gas. Yes, so that was a bit misleading for me to show you that. Yeah. Um, we're not ever going to be de uh, detecting large-scale inflows of gas from the IGM. Um, in sodium, I would say, because the IG, especially at Redshift 2, just didn't have a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of metals or anything in it. Um, so I would expect the covering fraction of those filaments to be a lot lower than what I've suggested I might be seeing here. So with the Milky Way, you have the H1, and I presume you also have some studies of sodium 1 in absorption. Mm -hmm. so, how those compare? Is the H1 that we know is infalling, that we have distances to, et cetera, is it also associated with infall signatures and in traces like sodium? That's a great question. It does have sodium, but that sodium is pretty weak. Um, I'm not sure. We're not able to study the, the H1 that we're only really able to study the H1 that has extreme velocities compared to most of the gas in our galaxy, which is a problem. So I'm not sure we would be able to actually identify the gas that's equivalent to what we're seeing here in sodium absorption. But in general, those high velocity clouds uh, that I showed at the beginning do have somewhat weak sodium absorption. Well, that's what I was expecting, actually. Um, but I don't, I, I mean, I think I haven't defined a criterion for detecting inflow uh, that can be applied for all the galaxies fairly yet. But I think that, so I need to be careful about um, making statements about which galaxies do and do not have inflow. But I do, I really want to pursue that question.
okay. Um, okay, so uh, thanks. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a grad student here. I'm working with Lars Hernquist. And I will tell you about some work I did with the illustrious simulation about the merger rate of, of galaxies. Um, okay, so I will start by, by showing you a, a very classic movie. Oops, it appeared in the other. Um, oops, wait a second. Okay, there we go, sorry. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so here you can see, uh, so this is a merger of two galaxies. It's a simulation, uh, but every once in a while it is compared to actual uh, real observations. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, so galaxy mergers are very important uh, for any galaxy formation model. They are believed to, uh, you know, uh, partially explain the, um, the distribution of galaxy morphologies that we observe in the universe. They can trigger starbursts or AGN, um, uh, uh, feeding of supermassive black holes, etc. So, uh, yeah, so they are very important. Um, so, uh, well, so in the Lustre simulation, Kate already showed a couple of images about that. You know, we have thousands of, of mergers like, like this. So it makes perfect sense to, uh, you know, to, to study mergers from a statistical uh, perspective uh, using illustrious. So that's what I will uh, tell you about. Um, so, uh, yeah, so mergers are important. Uh, here I will distinguish between two different kinds of mergers, uh, those between uh, dark matter halos and those between galaxies. So uh, it's usually assumed that uh, a merger between two, two dark matter halos is followed by the merger of the galaxies, although the relationship is not, uh, is not really so uh, straightforward. Uh, so, so if you know the, the merger rate of dark matter halos, you don't have uh, the, the merger rate of uh, galaxies. Um, now, the, the merger rate of dark matter halos is uh, theoretically uh, quite well understood. Uh, so that different uh, theoretical predictions uh, show us are different by a factor of, of two or so. Um, in particular, uh, there was a major breakthrough in uh, 2008 uh, with this study using the Millennium Simulation where it was found that the dark matter halo measure rate has, a, has an extremely simple form, mathematical form. So uh, it's what I'm showing here. So here, um, so this was using a, a dark matter only in body simulation. So, so here on the left, you have uh, like a, an absolute measure of the merger rate. So just how many mergers there are uh, per unit volume, per unit mass, per unit mass rate, and per unit redshift um, for, for different uh, descendant masses. Uh, so, so as you can see, there are more mergers of less massive uh, systems just because there are many more less massive galaxies in the universe. Um, but now, what they found here in this study is that is, is, is they, if they divide this uh, merger rate by the number density of galaxies, then essentially all of these lines overlap uh, on top of each other. So this is the merger rate per halo, and you know, it has a very simple dependence, a very weak mass dependence. And uh, so, so what I would like to point out here is that you know, uh, yeah, it has a very extremely simple form. So. This is the direction that we want to go in uh, with the lost when looking at galaxies. So, uh, so of course, this was dark matter hills. Now, look at what happens if you try to do the same with galaxies. Um, so, um, yeah, so here uh, we're looking at the major merger rate. So, considering only mergers uh, between with mass ranges of one to four or, or larger. So, major, major merger rate versus redshift. Um, so th there is a lot going on here, but I would only like to point out that uh, the color lines are different theoretical predictions uh, from, from galaxy formation models, uh, mostly semi-analytic models, one hydrodynamic simulation, but the, the scatter is, is huge. I mean, th there is a, like a, about an order of magnitude scatter. Um, so, of course, with a, uh, with a nice simulation like Illustrious, I think we can, uh, it would be, would be interesting to see, see what happens. Um, Okay, so, so yeah, the goal is uh, first to determine the galaxy merger rate as, as accurately as possible. And if, if the mathematical form turns out to be simple enough, also find a fitting formula uh, for it. Okay, so the illustrious. Uh, so you have probably heard a lot about the illustrious simulation. It's a hydrodynamic cosmological simulation. Um, it's on a relatively large uh, volume, about 100 megaparsecs per side. And uh, I think it has been uh, quite successful in um, 
in producing reasonably realistic populations of galaxies. So I will not bore you with details about Illustris, but I will only show what is probably my favorite image made from Illustris. Um, so this was made by Greg Snyder, who was a student here a couple of years ago. So the, this image is split in two. Um, one side is an image made from the simulation. The other side is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And the point is that it's, it's not trivial uh, to say which, which is the real image and which is the, the simulation. Um, well, probably the only hint uh, is that the, the real image has uh, diffraction from stars. So, uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, I would have uh, some trouble uh, uh, distinguishing. So, so yeah, so Illustrious produces uh, a nice uh, population of galaxies. So, um, so yeah, it makes sense to study the merger rate. Now, now the tools, uh, the main tool for calculating the merger rate are, are the merger trees. So uh, a merger tree is essentially a data structure that connects uh, halos or galaxies across different times or snapshots in the simulation. So here, for example, uh, we're looking at a massive galaxy at redshift zero. Um, and if you follow it, follow it back in time, then um, you know, this is what is called the main branch. So it's essentially the galaxy uh, seen at previous times. And these other branches are just other objects that merge into it. So, uh, so when two of these uh, branches merge, then we say that we have a merger. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the main idea. Um, so I actually developed some, some uh, code for, for, for this purpose. Um, it's called uh, Suplink. It, was, it appeared in, in a merger tree comparison project a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, you should uh, ch check it out. Um, OK, so, so now uh, for actual results. Um, um, this is how we define the merger rate. It's, it's simply the, the number of mergers per galaxy, per unit mass ratio, per, per time, per unit time. And it's a function of the, of the mass of the descendant, uh, the mass ratio of the two progenitors, and, and the redshift. So, uh, so this is uh, quite general, so that if you, if, you, if you are interested, for example, in uh, mer mergers above a certain mass ratio, more than major mergers, so more than one to four, then you just integrate with respect to uh, the mass ratio or something. Um, now, out of these three, uh, these three quantities, the mass ratio is the one that is uh, li li less trivial uh, to define. I think, I think it's where many people have, uh, have made uh, mistakes in the past. But uh, I, don't, I don't have time to, to tell you why. So, um, so I'll just say that you know, the, the resulting merger rate that we get uh, has a, a quite simple dependence on, the, uh, on these three parameters. So, uh, so the merger rate as a function of mass ratio is uh, essentially a power law. Um, so this is similar to the halo merger rate. Um, so these are different descendant masses. These are this is the least massive one. This is the most massive one. And the dashed line here is a fitting function uh, that I also present uh, in the paper. Now the lines are not exactly parallel uh, to each other. So if you observe closely, the, the, they op they spread up a little bit in, in this direction. But uh, still, it's, it's a power law anyway, so it's, uh, I think that's quite nice. Um, now, the, the, the mass dependence. Um, so this is a double power law. So, so here, it's, it's a bit different from uh, the halo merger rate, where, where it's modeled by a single power law. Uh, I think this, this, is a, this reflects the shape of the stellar mass halo mass uh, relation, which is also a double power law, if you remember. And finally, the the redshift dependence. It's a, almost a perfect uh, power law. Um, so this is for different masses, this is for, for different mass ratios. Again, the, the lines are not exactly parallel um, to each other. Um, I would also like to point out that uh, you know, this is a very strong redshift dependence, and, and it's something that people have not uh, agreed on uh, in recent years, both, both, both uh, from the observer side and, and theorists. They, they don't agree uh, if it's a uh, a strong, uh, strong function of pressure, flat or, or even uh, decreasing. So I will, I will show uh, a bit about this. Oh, oh and if you're interested, uh, so this is the fitting formula. So it's essentially a power law with redshift, uh, double power law with descent mass, and a power, power law with uh, mass ratio. So, so it's, it's the simplest thing I found that, that accurately described everything. Um, yeah, the chi square is 1.16, so, so it, it's, it's okay. It's, an, it's a reasonable fit. OK, so, so we saw that the, the mathematical form, the galaxy merger rate, is, is quite nice. 
but how does it compare to, to observations? Um, okay, I'm almost done. Um, so, uh, yeah, so here I'm showing the major merger rate. So mergers only one to four or larger as a function of redshift. Um, on the left, we have medium-sized galaxies. On the right, we have more massive galaxies. And the, the different colors are just different resolutions of illustries. So here you see that the results are also uh, uh, well converged. On the left, uh, we just compared to this uh, observational constraint. Um, um, and you know, there is agreement both in, in magnitude and, and slope. Uh, <clears throat> the, observ the observational constraint is still a bit large, so, so we cannot rule out uh, the, these other models. But, uh, but I mean, we're going the right direction. And then on the, on the right, the, the spread is much larger. There are even some observations that um, predict a flat or, or decreasing uh, redshift dependence. But, but overall, you know, there seems to be uh, agreement. Uh, we can do the same for the mass dependence. Um, so these are observations from a recent survey. Um, the, the observations do something strange here for the lower masses, but at least for the high masses, the interest agreement, which is, so this, this is a, a, a encouraging. And finally, so how does this compare to previous uh, theoretical work? Um, so this is from one of the most famous uh, attempts of, of uh, measuring the galaxy merger rate in the past. So here you're looking at the, <coughs> essentially the major merger rate as a function of redshift. Uh, for different descendant masses. So these are the most massive ones. These are the least massive ones. Um, the units are a bit different, but if we use the same units as they did, then we, we find something uh, strikingly different. Essentially, here it, it was found that the, the galaxy merger rate has a very weak redshift dependence, <coughs> but a strong uh, mass dependence, and we find the opposite. We find a strong redshift dependence and a weak mass dependence. So that, that was uh, quite a, a surprise. Um, we can look at the mass dependence in, in more detail, so this is very really strong, and uh, we find not, not uh, less uh, strong. Uh, from, so essentially, we find that the galaxy merger rate is more similar to the halo merger rate than was previously thought. Um, so yeah, the, the differences are large, but we also show that there seems to be an um, agreement with observations and some empirical models. So I think we're going in, in the right uh, direction. So I will just leave you with my conclusions. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Except for the very when lowest mass. Oh. Exactly on top. Yeah. 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 So, but, but yeah, in, in a qualitative sense, then I think it's quite similar. Also, the, the, the mass dependence is a bit stronger for the, uh, the galaxies than, than for, for halos. But, but yeah, there are many, there are many similarities. Yes. Yeah. Uh. Um, so you were comparing with observations and other simulations looking at merger rate versus redshift. But are there other correlators that could also be used to determine which models are kind of best fitting with observations, like doing merger rate versus star formation? Just other, other parameters oh, oh, yes, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's part of my current work to, to explore the, the merger rate as a function of other galaxy properties and, and environment. So that's, that's work in progress. And, and yeah, actually, there, is, there, is, there are actually strong dependencies uh, so that, you know, star-forming galaxies are more likely to merge and things like that. So, yeah, that does work, work in progress, but yeah, definitely. Okay. Good, thank you. Did this thing work for you? I think it was running out of power. Uh, I think. And I also found that I think I stole the. <laughs> the I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm interested also in the velocity dispersion of the galaxies and the gas. Oh yes. Oh, and I know Shai, okay. Shai just made a new catalog for this. 
Okay. And so it's something we could look at potentially. Okay. So uh, as a function of the, of the velocity of the galaxy. Yeah. So like the major mergers, and then yeah, to yeah. see what happens to the gas velocity dispersions, because this happens? mergers should induce turbulence. That's okay. My, okay. So so the velocity dispersion of each galaxy, not not of the galaxy in the chain, but, but each, each yeah, galaxy so like each itself. Yeah. Yeah. The merger, and then the you know the next step in the merger tree. What happened to the dispersion? Oh, the of the galaxy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So did you get an increase of dispersion? Okay. Or, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. We can talk okay. about it more. I know yeah, yeah. Shai sent me a new catalog he just made for this. Okay. <laughs> hmm. So how, how many are like? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, the merger <laughs> tree, obviously, but it, he, he's calculated uh, it's a function of redshift for these different uh, different galaxies. Yeah, yeah. Calculated guesses. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's let's, let's talk are more about this. this week? Uh, I'll be around here next okay, week I'll, also. I'll yeah. you okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how much Okay, great. 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 Well, you gotta play close to the edge. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And you said all the right things that you needed to say, so it's fine. Okay, okay.